Ahem. If confounding is like fog, then stratifying is unto the sun. So far, so far we have seen a number of situations where our main interest, right, our research question um, lies in testing the possible potential effect of a single explanatory variable on a single response variable, right? We focused on the situation where these are dichotomous variables. That is, they take only uh, two possible outcomes. And so that means we've been working with, um, well, two variables means two dimensional tables, but we've been working more specifically with two by two tables. However, we know from some discussions in STAT 512, as well as I, I think a certain um, a certain degree of common sense that we often need to account for or control for other possible variables. Uh, we call these other variables control variables, confounding variables, or um, as is common in this context, stratifying variables. This is analogous to uh, the confounding and ANCOVA, analysis of covariance discussions that we had in STAT 512. It also has parallels to the idea or concept of blocking, which is a type of experimental design that will be discussed in your forthcoming STAT 514 class. So, I mean, just a couple of, of somewhat common examples. Um, the first one's a very common clinical trial type example. Um, so, in clinical trials, it's very common to check whether the, the effect of an experimental drug, right, so we have, we have treatment control, and we have its effect, success, failure, so that's a two-by-two two table. But large clinical trials, right, often need to recruit in a variety of, say, research settings or a variety of hospitals. So it may be that a large clinical trial has some headquarters in New York, in Philadelphia, in Washington, D.C., in Chicago, and every one of these individual hospitals has its own two-by-two two table. So we have a third variable at play, right? We have, um, we have the treatment and control variable, we have the success failure variable, and we have a location variable or a center variable, right? So this, this idea of center effect is something that statistically needs to be checked for and perhaps controlled for. We might also wish to see whether the difference in performance on some standardized test, you pass it or you fail it, between two regions of Pennsylvania, urban and rural, is the same at public versus private school. So we have this kind of further level of division, this potential confounder. So in this case, instead of just a single two by two table, what do we have? We actually have two two by two tables. We have a set, a collection of two by two tables, right? We might think of these or we might verbalize these as different strata, right? Each table within this collection, we might refer to as a strata. If we think of, right, these tables now as being almost like this sort of three dimensional construct. Does that make sense? So yeah, so the previous example gives us a set of two by of two two by two tables. However, in in this particular lecture, we're going to consider and talk about the possibility of an arbitrary number q such table. So right, we're going to allow for the possibility of a large number, potentially large number of two by two tables. We are still going to keep our focus on two by two, although we are going to relax that assumption in uh, next week's lecture or next week's class. Now, one important goal in research and statistics is to be able to draw an overall conclusion about all of the data, right? All of the strata kind of considered collectively.
This is done with something called the mantle hansel test, or sometimes the Cochran mantle hansel test. Poor Cochran, sometimes there, sometimes not there. This test combines information from all of our different tables to help identify small but ideally consistent trends across these tables. It works best, and, and we will see why formulaically soon, it works best when such a consistent effect is present across all of the tables. So, instead of a single two by two table, we now have Q such tables, which means that we need to generalize our notation. We need essentially an extra subscript. So we have, instead of NIJ, we now have NHIJ, which is the number of experimental units in row I, column J. So I and J are playing the same role. But now we have to say which table we're talking about. So that's going to be table H. We can use the same sort of reasoning that we discussed when we talked about the randomization chi-square test to in Reduce a hypergeometric distribution on each of these tables. So for every table, we induce this hypergeometric. So for every table, we have just a single random variable. It's that upper left-hand cell, cell count, that N11. But we have an N11 for every one of our tables, right? So for, for some arbitrary table H, we have a cell count N11 under the null hypothesis. Its expected value is that is that NH1 plus uh, times NH plus 1 over NH. And some variance, right? We can get the variance formula just by, by looking up the hypergeometric distribution in a textbook. And so just like before, right, we have this, we have the same mean for, for the table. We have some variance, right? The, there is a closed form formula. Our textbook knows it. SAS knows it. It's, it's, it's not intuitive or important enough for me to, to bother typesetting it into this PowerPoint. But we have it. And of course, this differs, potentially differs from table to table. Now, our our overall test statistic, a test statistic which will give us an ideal, ideally overall conclusion as to the relationship between our main variables of interest, X and Y, which aggregates or collects information from across the tables, looks like this. It's the sum of the NHI minus the MHI. So it looks like what? It looks like observed minus expected. So we're looking at observed minus expected for every one of those tables, and we're summing that up. And then we're squaring that sum. Now, notice, and this is important, this is, this is, this is somewhat atypical for a test statistic. The squaring is happening after the summation, which means what? It means that we could have, with, with, within that summation, we could have positive and negative numbers canceling out. This is why this test statistic works best when there's a consistent trend. By consistent trend, we mean that, that the observed cell counts tend to be consistently above the expected cell counts, or consistently below the expected cell counts, right? If we have that consistency, then we don't have a lot of cancellations going on in this sum. Right? Because ideally we want we want what? We want a small test statistic to be indicative of um to be indicative of um of no relationship. And we want a large test statistic to be indicative of there right, being a relationship between the two of them. Right? Does, uh, does that make sense? So if our null hypothesis is correct, right, and our null hypothesis is that Right, there's not a relationship between these these x and y's. If our null hypothesis is correct, 
then the observed values will be close to what we expect them to be under the null hypothesis for each of our tables. So all of those sums will be relatively close to zero. We add up a bunch of numbers that are close to zero. We square it, it's still close to zero. We get a test statistic that's relatively close to zero. Of course, if our null hypothesis is wrong, then our observed values will be far from what we would expect them to be under the null hypothesis. And so we have a bunch of, of, of larger numbers, right? And we add a bunch of larger numbers, we get a large number, we square up, we get a large number. Although this is, right, potentially, this is, um, this is potentially ruined by the concept that maybe, right, we have some numbers that are way above it and some numbers that are way below it. We have these sort of inconsistencies in the tables that lead to canceling out, which again is why, right, this works better we do have a consistent relationship between our different tables. All right, so we said um, we said as long as that's sufficiently large, it follows um, a chi-square distribution. Um, what what is um, sufficiently large um, for our sample? it's going to be, um, our sample is going to be considered sufficiently large whenever uh, both of the combined row sample sizes, right? So we're focusing on two by two. So we just have two rows. So for the first row, basically add up the row totals for all the tables. Check that that's more than 30. For the second row, add up all the row totals um, for all the tables and make sure that that's also more than 30. So how well does this process work? This process is very powerful for detecting association, kind of as we've insinuated, when all of the odds ratios from all of the tables are in the same direction. That is, right, all of the odds ratios, or at least most of the odds ratios, are all more than one or less than one. It's not effective, but still valid when you have odds ratios in opposite directions. By valid, we mean it still works at the designated alpha level whenever the null hypothesis is true. All right, so let's, uh, let's take a look at an example of this, um, right, in the context of a real-life data set. Um, this is a Finnish respiratory infection data set um, based on American Journal of Public Health, I believe, uh, 1991. Um, in this study, the authors wanted to investigate if highly polluted cities, um, right, so pollution, has any effect on the presence or absence of respiratory infections in three-year-old children. So that's their, that's their main question of interest, but they want to take into account potential confounding factors. So what, what confounding factors do you think they might want to consider? All right, a confounding in factor is, right, something that might also influence our Y variable, right, respiratory infections, right, other than, right, our variable of interest, pollution. My answer, or what the what the authors did, is on the next slide. So you can go there if you want to see the answer to what they ended up controlling for, what they kind of focused on as their most important confounder. But again, it's a nice mental exercise to kind of think it through yourself. Maybe pause this video and write down maybe a couple ideas of your own and see if you're on the same page or not um, as these uh, as these Finnish public health experts. So in this particular study, the authors controlled for what they called passive smoke. It's just secondhand smoke, which basically just means, right, whether or not the parents um, of the children were smoking at home or not. So here's the data set. Um, right, so we put it all together. Uh, passive means secondhand smoke. So was there secondhand smoke, yes or no? Um, did the city, what was its pollution level, which was either high pollution, low pollution, and was there or was there not respiratory um, infection? So you see it's a somewhat large data set. We can, we, can, we can analyze this. We can do the overall Cochrane Mantle Hansel test with the CMH option. So there's our proc freak. There's our weight statement. 
there's our table statement. So notice our table statement now has three variables. In theory, you could put four, five, six, seven. There's no limit to the number of variables that you can put there. The last two will always be row by column, and then it will just build that many two-dimensional tables, right? Because that's all SAS can build is a two-dimensional table. It's all we can visualize. It'll build a two-dimensional table for every combination of all the other variables to the left of those two variables. Now here we have only one, right? So passive is going to be our stratifying or, con or confounding variable. The chi-square option will give us information for analyzing each table individually, right? So it'll we'll have we'll have one table for um, for children whose parents smoked. We'll have one table for children whose parents did not smoke. The chi-square option will give us a statistical analysis of these two separate tables. The CMH option will aggregate the information in both of these tables to give us an overall conclusion. So here is the table for um, for children. It looks like 284 children who come from homes where their parents smoked, and we can see right all the usual information down there. Here is the table for all the children whose um, parents did not smoke. And then the output that's new to us, right, that, that comes to us from the CMH option, the Cochrane Mantle Hansel option, is this page right here. And the test of significance as to really what we're saying, whether or not there's a relationship between um, pollution and respiratory infection controlling for the possible effect of secondhand smoke. Now, right now, all three of these three lines, right? Non-zero correlation, row mean, and general association. For a two by two table, these all are gonna look the same. They're all gonna have the same test statistics. They're all gonna have the same p-value. We will consider larger tables next lecture. And when we have larger tables, these numbers will not necessarily have to be the same. But when we're working with a two by two table, these will be the same. And so there's our test statistic, and, and in particular, our p-value, right? Our p-value is 0.0112. That's smaller than the usual 0.05 alpha level, which means we re would, re would reject the null hypothesis, right? There is sufficient evidence to conclude that respiratory infections differ depending on whether you're in high or low pollution cities after controlling for secondhand smoke. All right, so, I mean, I've, I've kind of already talked us through the analysis. Um, again, because it's sort of easier to kind of point out bits and pieces from the output while we're looking at it. Um, but let's go ahead and, and kind of use a few slides to guide us through how we might kind of think about this, um, this process, how we might think about this analysis. Now, the first question that we might start with um, a little bit of practice of what we learned how to do last class. Um, so maybe a little bit of a limbering up exercise before to make sure we don't uh, make sure we don't pull anything as we uh, slowly transition to some heavier mental lifting. Is what what do our conclusions look like at the individual table level? So again, remember, I, I need to stop saying this. I'll, I'll maybe make this the last time I say it. Um, but I would strongly encourage you to print out the PowerPoints before listening to the videos. Then you're going to have the actual table sitting in front of you. And you could pause this video and then look at your tables and see where these different numbers are coming from. Right? Because, again, finding them yourself is the actual process of learning. So you should always... When I'm putting numbers on the slide, you should always be checking the output and seeing where those numbers came from. So, if we focus on the table for secondhand smokers, or for homes that had secondhand smoke, 83% of the sample children had um, 
had respiratory illness. In the low pollution cities, 75.61% of the children had respiratory illness. Um, so although technically there was a higher rate of respiratory illness in the high pollution cities, probably as we might expect, that difference is not significant. All right, the p-value is 0.1152. So we would say that there is not a significant difference between the, uh, the high and low pollution cities. If we focus on the table um, of, of homes or children who, who, came, who did not have parents who smoked, we would see that 67.37% of the sampled children from high pollution cities had respiratory illness compared to 5825 that came from low pollution cities had respiratory illnesses. In this case, the p-value is just barely significant. 0.0449. This means, um, since it is significant, albeit barely, that there is a significantly higher incidence of, of respiratory illness in high pollution cities. Now, what have we observed in these two tables? We have observed a consistent trend. In both tables, there was a higher percentage of respiratory illness in the high pollution cities. So we have seen a consistent trend, which makes us think that the overall test should work well. But remember, to justify using the overall test, we need to make sure that our sample size is sufficiently large. Remember the rule of thumb for the sample size being sufficiently large was that for both rows, the combined row totals over all tables had to be more than 30 or 30 or more. So again, look at these tables, verify where my numbers are coming from. The first thing I have to check is 190 plus 120. 190 is the, um, is the total number of children in the top row from the first table. 120 is the total number of children in the top row from the second table. Right, that's what I'm adding up and checking versus 30. And then, right, I go back to my first table. I look at the row total for the second row, add that to the row total from the second row from my second table. And in this case, they're both well over 30. So our sample size is, in fact, justified. So as we kind of already concluded when we were looking at the output, um, our p-value was 0 0.0112. So we would say that after adjusting for passive smoke, there is a difference in respiratory illness between high and low pollution cities. So we're seeing a little bit of the value of this combined test, right? When we looked at the two at the two tables individually, we saw that, it, that, the, that the incidence of respiratory illness was higher in high pollution cities for both of these tables. But for one table, the sample size just wasn't large enough to make it significant. And for the other table, right, I guess that combination of sample size and, um, and effect size was such that it was just barely significant. However, combining the consistent information of both tables together gives us a, a stronger, more confident conclusion that's well below the usual 0.05 threshold. So this is a very nice example to showcase, right, how this overall test combines information. Now, when we make conclusions like there is an effect or, right, sample means are different, right, sample proportions are different, I'm sorry, population means are different, population proportions are different, right, there's always this natural follow-up question, well, okay, how are they different, which one is more, which one is less. Now, for this example, that follow-up question is probably easy to answer, Right, that follow-up question is probably easy to answer. In both of our tables, we saw high pollution cities had more respiratory illness. So we would imagine that the conclusion after adjusting it would still be that high pollution cities 
have more respiratory illness than low pollution cities. However, we might imagine a situation where we have, say, three, four, ten tables. And, and, and we're looking at ten different tables, and it becomes harder to get a sense of, like, okay, like, how does all this information from these ten different sources, in which direction does it ultimately aggregate, right? That does become a bit more challenging. And so it would be nice to have a numeric measurement that tells us, okay, there is an overall relationship. What's the direction of the relationship? And also what would be nice, what's the magnitude of that relationship? Which would also be nice in this example, right? In this example, we might imagine, we might, we might think it's, it's sensible that, okay, probably my conclusion is that high pollution cities, after adjusting, have a higher incidence rate of respiratory illness. But how much higher, right, is still an unanswered question. And so let's go ahead and figure out how we might be able to measure, when we're doing an overall combined analysis, how we might measure both the direction and strength of any observed relationship. So I think summarizing what I just said, when we have lots of tables, each with a relatively low sample size, it can be difficult to ascertain what a significant association means, i.e. which treatment's more likely than the other. Also, we know from STAT 512 that a significant difference doesn't always equate with a meaningful difference. So, right, it, it actually could be something like, well, it's significant and we know its direction, but we look at its effect size and it's actually a very, a very small, perhaps meaningless effect size. So, the solution to this problem or, right, how we measure this direction and strength of relationship is with a pooled odds ratio, sometimes referred to as an overall odds ratio. So the most commonly used pooled or common odds ratio is referred to as the Mantle-Hansel odds ratio estimator. Here we're going to use the Greek letter psi. And so let's, let's have psi hat. So psi hat just means it's our best guess, it's a sample generated best guess of an odds ratio. The subscript H means for table H. And we calculate for each table, we calculate our, um, our, our best guess for the odds ratio, just like we have from previous lectures. That's just the, the, the usual shortcut odds ratio formula. So we calculate a sample odds ratio for every table. And if all of the tables do in fact have a, a common same overall odds ratio, this is referred to as the odds ratios being homogenous, then the Mantle-Hansel odds ratio estimator is, and there's the formula, and this becomes an estimator from the hypothesized common odds ratio. So you can look at that formula. Um, you can see there's a summation on the top, a summation on the bottom. Both summations are summing over all tables. Um, I, I haven't really come up with like a really intuitive way of breaking that formula down. I mean, one nice thing that we can perhaps look at is, at the very least, do you see how if we're actually working with just one table, that is Q equals one, do we see that that actually simplifies to just the formula for just an odds ratio for a single table? That much should hopefully make sense to us. And if not, you should kind of maybe try plugging some numbers in. That's a, that's a nice way of seeing it for yourself. And or if you're struggling with that, maybe reach out to me and, and I can help you out. Um, there are other estimators. Um, other than the Mantle-Hansel, um, probably foremost of the other estimators is something referred to as the Logit estimator, um, which is something that we'll see soon in SAS output. Um, but the Logit estimator has more stringent sample size requirements. Um, and so because of that, it's typically recommended to use the Mantle-Hansel estimator instead. Although we'll see, they're typically very, very close to one another. Now, 
one last side consideration is this. It only makes sense to generate an estimate of a common odds ratio if, in fact, we really think there's a common odds ratio to estimate. Right? The whole idea of a common odds ratio is we think that every one of these tables has the same odds ratio, a common odds ratio, and so that's what we want to estimate. But if they don't have the same odds ratio, it doesn't make sense to estimate something that's not, that's not really there. And so what that does is it motivates for us wanting to have some technique, some test, to detect whether or not we think there really is a common odds ratio. This is particularly useful because, as we already saw earlier, the Mantle-Hansel test has very little power when there isn't homogeneity of odds ratios, when the odds ratios aren't the same, or right, it has little power particularly when they are in different directions. And so that leads us to the last test that we're going to talk about in this week's lecture, and that is the Breslow Day test. So the Breslow Day test works like this. It's a test for the homogeneity of odds ratios. It works by first calculating. It first calculates that estimate for a common odds ratio. So it basically says, if there really is a common odds ratio, what would be our best guess for it? That's our psi hat MH. And it then computes this test statistic, which we call... Uh, which we call Q sub BD, BD as in Breslow Day. And there's a lot of summations there, but that's really just saying sum over all cells, right? Sum over all tables, all rows, all columns. So it says for every cell from every table, look at um, NHIJ, so the number of observations in that cell, minus MHIJ, now that's not a speck of dirt on your monitor. That is, in fact, a prime. That's, a, that's an apostrophe. Which, is, which means it's a little different than our usual MHIJ notation. So the M prime is the expected cell count generated under the assumption that all data is being generated from a, that common odds ratio, psi hat MH. So basically, for every cell, we're, we're looking at what's actually there relative to what we would expect to be there if all of the tables were, being, were coming from a situation where they all had a common odds ratio, right? And so if, in fact, the tables have a common odds ratio, then what we observe will be close to what we would expect from a common odds ratio. If they're all coming... If they all have different odds ratios, then what we observe will probably be different than what we expect to see if there was a common odds ratio. All right, so, um, so a small value of our test statistic is going to indicate um, is going to indicate that all the odds ratios are the same, whereas a large value of the test statistic, the larger, the stronger the evidence um, against all of the odds ratios being the same. Now we could show mathematically that for a sufficiently large sample size and under the assumption of the null hypothesis being true, this follows a chi-square distribution with Q minus one degrees of freedom, with Q minus one degrees of freedom. And so this is, right, symbolically what our null and alternative hypotheses look like for the Breslow day test. So, right, this might help us kind of understand what's going on there. The null hypothesis is that the odds ratio for table one is the same as the odds ratio for table two, right, is dot, 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 same for all of those tables. Whereas the alternative is that the odds ratio for some table i is not equal to that of some table j for at least one set of i not equal to j, right? At least two tables have odds ratios that are different from one another. So symbolically, that's what our Breslow day test is doing or testing. Now, we say sufficiently large, right? Common theme of the class. What do we mean by sufficiently large? Well, a common rule of thumb, at least one 
put forth by our, by our textbook is that for the Breslow day test to be justified, we want at least 80% of the expected cell counts to be greater than five. And that's when we're looking at individual tables. So looking at all the different cells and all the individual tables, we want at least 80% of those um, to be greater than five. Now, now, what is this reminiscent of? What does this remind you of? And if we can think of what it reminds us of, then that will give us some nice intellectual intellectual scaffolding that we can kind of build off of, right? Because this is like a pretty, it's a pretty big idea from STAT 512. If that Breslow day test is significant, it's essentially saying that the odds ratio in different tables is is different. So it's saying something like um it's saying something like what's the relationship between um between um treatment and control and outcome? If the Breslow day test is significant, then it's saying, well, the answer to that question depends. It depends upon whatever, maybe what race is, whatever our stratifying variable is. It depends upon age. Maybe that relationship is different for younger patients than it is for older patients. And it, what does that sound like? That sounds like interaction, right? Interaction from STAT 512 was what? Interaction was the idea that the relationship between X and Y depends upon some third variable Z. And that's exactly what we're seeing. This is like a like a categorical analog of interaction. The Breslow day test is essentially saying whether or not the relationship between X and Y depends upon some stratifying variable Z. So hopefully when we start thinking about this in the context of interaction, right, a concept that we've already mastered from STAT 512, it'll make it a little bit easier for us to work with and digest. So that's everything big picture. What I want to do now is I want to go through two examples to wind down this week's lecture. Before we do that, let's tie these concepts together into this nice, cohesive, coherent kind of flow chart process. When you're working with um, a set of tables, what I would suggest is first, step one, check your Breslow day test statistic to see whether or not there's homogeneity of odds ratios. That becomes kind of like our, our gatekeeper, our first test. Now, if this test statistic is non-significant, non-significant means that there is a common odds ratio. So we can use the Mantle-Hansel test to test for overall significance, and we could calculate a pooled odds ratio, a common odds ratio. However, if the Breslow day test is significant, that's saying that there is not a common odds ratio, that the tables, at least two tables, have different odds ratios. And what that means, what that implies, is that we should be analyzing each table separately. All right, so let's go ahead Let's look at two examples and get some practice kind of working through this process. All right, so continuing our ever spiraling descent into increasingly depressing examples, another theme of our course, we are now going to talk about um, extramarital affairs and divorce. Yeah, we'll, we'll follow up our discussion of respiratory illness and um, pollution which was preceded, of course, by discussions of death penalties and racism and discussions of cancer and right all the other horribly depressing things that were talked about. Let's go ahead and transition on to, uh, to broken homes and ruined relationships. So here is uh, some real life marital affairs data. Um, the, the study took a sample of men, some of which were currently married, some of which were in the process of filing for divorce. 
um, and they were asked if they had engaged in, this is I think the paper's language, extramarital affairs. I'm not sure why we don't just say affairs. I'm not sure there's a difference between extramarital affair and an affair um, during their former um, or present marriage. So the outcome of interest, the main outcome of interest um, was marital status. And um, so really they were looking at like, are, have, is having an affair associated with getting a divorce, right? That's the basic question that's being asked. And the researchers wanted to look into a potential confounder, and that was whether or not the men had had premarital sex, right? Had they had sex before, um, before they were married? So for those of you that want to actually kind of play around with the data itself, I try whenever possible to provide you the data that we're looking at. So there's the actual data set if you want to load it up and play around with it, right? We have premarital sex, yes or no, um, extramarital affair, yes or no, um, there's current status, divorced or married, and then how many men fall into each of these different uh, categories. There's our proc freak statement, um, right? Order equals data. So we're ordering things based on the order they appear in the data set, um, right? There's our table. Our, our main table is going to be, uh, the rows will be a fair yes or no. The columns will be um, divorced or married. And then we're going to make tables, different tables based on um, whether or not they had premarital sex. And so let's kind of take a brief look at the output. I'm not going to get too into it because um, I have some, some following slides which will kind of walk us through our analytical approach. Again, ideally you have these things printed and sitting next to you, but right, if I have the chi-square option as is, is well as the CMH option, it's going to look like this. I'll have the table for uh, men that had premarital sex. I'll have the table for men who did not have premarital sex. And then here I'll have the, uh, the, the Breslow day test, right, which is at the very, very bottom, the Cochrane mantle hansel test, which is on the very top, and then the actual, um, the actual estimate for the common odds ratio, which is that thing in the middle where it says case control mantle hansel That's the mantle hansel common odds ratio estimator, right? So, so there's kind of all the information. Some of it we'll need, some of it we won't. So let's go ahead and kind of walk through our thought process. So I said, um, I said step one, start with the Breslow day test. Now, before we apply the Breslow day test, right, we should do our due diligence and ask ourselves, is this test justified? It turns out the answer is yes. If you go back and look at all of the expected cell counts, we have eight of them, right? Two, uh, two, two by two tables for a total of eight cells. All of those cells have an expected cell count um, above five. So, so we're justified in using the Breslow day test. So let's do it. Now, the results of the Breslow day test is the p-value of 0 0.0277. This means that there is evidence to conclude that the tables do not have a common odds ratio. And as such, we should analyze the table separately. That is what we're concluding is that the relationship between having an affair and still being married differs it's an interesting observation, differs depending upon whether or not the men had, had, uh, had engaged in premarital sex. So starting with the table um, that, that um, consists of men who had engaged in premarital sex, uh, first check all the expected cell counts. And if we do that, we observe that um, all the expected cell counts are more than five. In fact, we already observed that um, when, we, when we checked for the Breslow day test. So we're justified in, in applying a Pearson's chi-squared test to this table. Um, looking at the descriptive statistics, um, about 72% of men who had an affair ended up divorced, whereas in, <laughs> whereas in only 59% only, uh, of men who did not have an affair <laughs> were divorced. Yeah, it's kind of bleak looking data, right? Presumably these were men that were maybe seeking counseling. I'm not completely familiar with this study. And so I don't know if you're seeking counseling, maybe you're already a little bit disposed uh, to get a divorce. Um, I, I think the world is actually much more optimistic. I think actually, if you get married, I think you only have you only have a 50% chance of being divorced overall. So um, there must be some sort of extra um, extra circumstance kind of being baked into uh, 
to what's going on here. Um, now, technically, and maybe not surprisingly, um, it does look like the men who had an affair do have a, a have a slightly elevated, or at least in our sample, there's more men who got divorced in the extramarital affair um, group than the than the non-affair group. Um, however, that difference turns out to be not significant. In fact, not even that close to significant. The p-value is 0.1549, so we would conclude that there is not a significant difference in divorce rate um, between those that had an affair and those that had not. Um, so that means, right, that means that for those that engaged in premarital sex, at least, right, for those that engaged in premarital sex, Apparently, um, apparently having an affair does not increase your risk of a divorce. I don't know. That may, that may be good news. That may be bad news. I will, I will leave it to you to make your own, uh, your own moral judgments regarding that. Um, for those men that did not have premarital sex, again, check our expected cell counts. They're fine. So we're okay doing the, the Pearson chi-square test. Here we see a different story, right? Amongst men who had not engaged in premarital sex, um, a, a pretty high percent, again, 81% of those that had an affair um, ended up getting a divorce, but a much lower percentage of those who had an affair ended up getting divorced, right? So, or those who had not had an affair, excuse me, um, ended up getting divorced. Only 34% of those who had not had an extramarital affair ended up getting divorced. Much larger difference between the two. The p-value is, in this case, extremely significant, less than 0 0.0001. So that means that for men that did not have premarital sex, um, those that had an extramarital affair were significantly more likely to get divorced than those who had not, right? That actually it makes a little bit of sense, doesn't it, right? That is, um, presumably, if, if um, I, I guess, um, Maybe this is a little bit speculative, but I might speculate that um, for for those that abstain from premarital sex, to them, like the idea, the concept of um, right of consummating a relationship, of 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 having sex, um, is like is a little bit more sacred than those that maybe were willing to do it before getting married, and so because of that, um, right. Maybe it also means the act of marriage is like a little bit more sacred. So a, they're less likely to to remove themselves from that for no reason. But at the same time, right, like the idea of having an affair or cheating is like a little bit more egregious. Um, I don't know. It, it makes a little bit of sense to me, so I, I find it not surprising. Right here, here. So here we see an example um, where we need to do a table by table analysis. Right, basically, um, having an affair seems to matter quite a bit for men that. Um, did not have premarital sex where it appears to not make a difference um, for those who had engaged in premarital sex. Um, all right, so there's a, a somewhat maybe interesting, may or may not be bleak example um, using some real life data and just kind of whatever, the everyday interactions that we engage in as, a, as adult human beings. And so with this example behind us, um, we're ready for one last depressing example. And here it is, right? Our our beloved, <laughs> our much beloved, much ballyhooed uh, death penalty example. So um, last lecture, we looked at the relationship between uh, the race of the defendant and the verdict um, in terms of whether or not they got the death penalty. And I don't know, actually, maybe maybe this is not a depressing example because maybe it was good news, right? Maybe at least for like for Florida, this part of Florida at this time. It actually looked like, I mean, what we would hope for, right? What we would aspire for. It perhaps surprisingly appeared that 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 Lady Justice was in fact colorblind, right? We concluded there was no significant association between the race of the defendant and whether or not they got the death penalty. And it, although surprisingly, we saw um, that at least in terms of point estimates. That, that white defendants had a slightly larger um, that a slightly larger number of white defendants in our sample received the death penalty, although that was not large enough to indicate a significant difference. So so that was good news. So why not double down on the good news that we've had? Surely, surely we're not going to somehow take this one nice thing, this this beautiful example of racial equality 
and use statistics to somehow turn it into some sort of sad story or narrative about um, about our society's prejudices? Surely not, right? Well, let's see. <laughs> let's dig our hole a little bit deeper. So what if we controlled for an additional variable? In particular, I actually think this is one of the more interesting examples that I've seen. And again, this is real life data. What the researchers did is they controlled for the race of the victim. So, right, all of these trials were murder trials. So the defendant killed somebody, or at least was alleged to kill somebody. Now let's look at this with this extra piece of information, and that's the race of the person that they were alleged to kill. And let's see if that changes things at all. So here's our more descriptive data set. We have the victim's race, white or black, the defendant's race, white or black, and the verdict. Did that defendant get the death penalty, yes or no? And how many people fall into all these different categor categories? And then we use Proc Freak to build our table. Um, we're interested in tables of defendant's race by verdict. And we're going to have two different tables, one for where the victim's race was um, white and one for where the victim's race was black. So here's the one. Um, again, I'm just going to kind of gloss over this very quickly, and then I'm going to use some PowerPoints to talk about it. I would, I would, if possible, have these printed up so you can refer to them during our discussion. Here's the table for, uh, for defendants who had white victims. Here's the table for those that had black victims. And then here's the relevant information, well, the information that may or may not be relevant if we actually think that those two tables have a common relationship. This is how we can analyze it. So we said that the typical process starts with the Breslow day test. But for this particular example, I want to start by looking at the individual tables just out of sort of a curiosity um, a, a way to get better acquainted with this data set. Also, I, I've seen this data set before, at least through one lens, and I want to see if looking at it through this different lens, this stratification lens, has changed any of, of what we have seen already or what we have seen previous. So, if we focus just on the table of white victims, what do we see? We see that white defendants received the death penalty 11.35% of the time. And we note that black defendants received the death penalty 22.92% of the time. What the cut the? Didn't we see before? Didn't we see before when we looked at our table that white defendants were more likely to get the death penalty? And then now, all of a sudden, we stratify, and it looks like that's completely reversed itself. Now it looks like black defendants are getting the death penalty at almost twice the rate. Now, a side, a side observation, when we're looking at the table with white victims, I want you to look, um, look along those margins and see that when there's white victims, it appears that the majority of defendants um, are themselves white. So that indicates um, at least the possibility that this idea of violent crime seems to kind of be largely within, within race. That for the most part, white defendants are being accused of, of killing, of murdering uh, white victims. Incidentally, if we look at that, if we look at that third, um, If we look at that third bullet point, it's the same for for uh, for black um, for black victims. The majority um, of the defendants, when there's a black victim, are also black. Kind of reinforcing our idea that violent crime seems to stay within race. That it's relatively rare, right, for there to be a white defendant and a black victim, or a black defendant and a white victim. Now, right, what do we see here? Right, we see that white defendants received the death penalty a sad 0% of the time when there was a black victim. And black defendants also received the death penalty 2.8% of the time 
So interestingly, we also see that, in fact, right, black defendants are getting the death penalty at a higher rate in both cases, which is maybe surprising, given what we had seen last lecture. But we can maybe kind of get a little sense of, of what's going on with the idea that it actually seems like it's the victim that matters. And that is, right, if it's a black victim, then it's less likely that whoever committed the crime is going to see a death penalty, either white or black, although we do see that, that technically black defendants are getting the death penalty a little bit more often than white, 2.8% more. Whereas if it's a white victim, right, the probability of the death penalty goes up quite a bit to whatever it was, 11 for white defendants, 22% for black defendants. That is, sadly, it appears that maybe there's like a higher value being placed by this judicial system for a white victim than a black victim, which is sad, but does maybe, right, um, more clearly kind of fit into, right, some of the discussions that are being brought forth with kind of our recent Black Lives Matters and related movements. So, wow, what the cut the, right? Once again, right, I'm eating my brain. What's going on, right? How could we, how could we analyze a data set one way and say, hey, good news, right? Uh, justice is colorblind. In fact, if anything, it looks like white defendants are getting the death penalty more. When, and if we analyze it a different way, that is stratifying for a potential confounder, adjusting for the, the potential confounding, well, in this case, the definite confounding of the victim's race, all of a sudden the story is dramatically different, right? Justice is no longer colorblind. And in fact, we see that, right, in either case, black defendants are much more likely to get the death penalty than white defendants. Wow. Great example, right? Sad example. Right from a from a sort of society standpoint, but I, I do think a very interesting example from a statistical standpoint, and showing right the the incredible subtleties and nuances that come into play when we're looking at really like these these very complicated real life phenomenon situations. So again, how do we sort of explain this discrepancy? It's one I, I encourage you to kind of sit down and wrestle with. Um, the, the, the main rationale is that violent crime, as we already observed, tends to be within race, right? Uh, whites are killing whites, blacks are killing blacks. And there were many crimes in this period in Florida where the victims were white. So at this time, at this part of Florida, it appeared that most of the victims, at least the ones that came up in trial, were white victims. And when the victims were white, there tended to be a much higher probability of the death penalty. So when we kind of lumped everything together and ignored the race of the victim, right, it looked like whites were getting death penalties more, but that's only because whites tended to be more likely to kill other whites. And that when the victim was white, there tended to be a higher probability of getting the death penalty. When we parsed it out and separated the victims, right, by white and black, we saw, right, a more honest story. This very interesting phenomenon is called Simpson's Paradox. It's just one of many examples. And there's lots of really interesting examples of real life situations that fall into Simpson's Paradox. Um, it has its own Wikipedia article. I encourage you to check it out. Um, it has some kind of interesting examples, and there's plenty of other things that you can Google and research as well. So nice keyword if you want to kind of dig a little deeper. More broadly, Simpson's paradox occurs when the marginal table exhibits an association totally different from the partial tables. And this is usually due to a disparity within the rows and the partial tables. It's what we observed. So big picture aside, let's kind of more objectively analyze the data the way that I said that we should. Start with the Breslow day test. Now, interestingly, 
in, in this example, because there were so relatively few uh, black victims, and in particular, I think black victims that had white defendants, only six out of eight of our cells have an expected cell count um, of five or more. At 75%, which is not quite our 80%. So I, in this case, we're, we're not technically justified. I would, I would proceed with caution. Now, the p-value for the Breslow day test is 0 0.2038. So it's not, it's not at a borderline 0 0.05. So that makes me feel a little bit better using it. Um, 0 0.2038 means that there is not evidence to conclude that the two tables have differing odds ratios. And so we can aggregate and look at a common odds ratio. And again, I feel a little bit comfortable with that conclusion I, because I did look at both tables individually. And that's what I might do in a situation where the Breslow day test is not quite justified. I might do both. I might look at the table separately and look at what the common odds ratio looks like and see whether they're all in agreement with one another. In this example, they will be. When I looked at the table separately, both tables seemed to indicate that, right, that black defendants were more likely to get the death penalty than white defendants. So, right, both of those indicated an agreement in direction, if not, if not magnitude. And so that makes me feel a little bit more comfortable combining their information. So now we can look at the common odds ratio. Um, first, we look at the p-value. The p-value is 0 0.0161. So that is significantly different than 1. The actual estimate is 0 0.4119. The 95% confidence interval, again, go back to the output and find these numbers yourself. The 95% confidence interval is 0 0.1991 to 0 0.8591. So we would say that we are 95% confident that the odds of the death penalty for white defendants after adjusting for victims race, right? We need to include that in our conclusion because it's important. After adjusting for the confounding of victims race is between 0 0.1991 and 0 0.8591 times that of black defendants. Right, so between 20 to 86 percent that of black defendants. Right, so kind of a nice, interesting example to end with. I'm sure we'll find some new depressing example to continue our our um, ever-evolving discussion of categorical analysis. This wraps up, I believe, what is this, our third week, and so I'll see you in seven days for week four.